Welcome to valuable subscribers and to those of you out there in the audience to our Southern California News Group Newsmakers Virtual Program. It's aimed to bring you some of the most interesting and exciting personalities in our region and beyond. So right now, I want to introduce you to Peter Larson, who's been our pop culture reporter for the Orange County Register since 19, oh, excuse me, since 2004, it seems like 19 something, since 2004, and now for the Southern California News Group. He has achieved the neat trick of getting paid to report and write about the stuff he's been obsessed with pretty much all his life. He regularly covers the Oscars and the Emmys when we used to do those things in person, and he goes to Comic-Con and Coachella again when we used to do those things in person, reviews pop music, and conducts interviews with actors, musicians, directors, and with authors such as today's guest, Dean Koontz. Peter, I'm going to give it to you. Hi, Sam. Thank you for that. Um, and welcome to everybody who is here to uh, hear, hear Dean Koontz talk about uh, his latest book, Elsewhere, as well, as well as anything else that, you know, we happen to get to before we switch over to uh, taking some questions. Um, uh, Dean Koontz, of course, is one of the all-time greats of of uh, suspense thrillers, often with some some paranormal aspects or creative touches that that have made him uh, unique in his field. Uh, he's he's written many many books and had many many bestsellers, uh, and so we're pleased, very pleased, to have him tonight uh, to talk with us about his latest, uh, a book titled Elsewhere. Um, welcome, Dean. Well, I'm glad to be there with you, Peter. And I'm sorry you've had you've been cursed to have to interview me a number of times. Oh, but I, but I'll try to make this one a little different. Okay, good. <laughs> um, well, so it, it, this this latest book, uh, Elsewhere, uh, has has some new elements to it uh, that that you haven't explored before in your in your career, and with. Uh, you know, with more than I think seventy novels at this point, uh, finding new new twists is is uh, a, a, an admirable thing. Um, so I guess I would just start by asking you to to tell us a little bit uh, uh, of what the story in Elsewhere is for those who you know the book has been out about a week now. Uh, for, for the uninitiated, uh, you know, tell us, give us just sort of a, a hint of what it is, and then we'll go into that more deeply as we converse. Well, it's, it's a story about a father and daughter and the mother walked out on them seven years ago and is presumed dead because nobody's heard from her. And, uh, and then into their life comes a homeless man, gives them a box, with, uh, which is an object he says costs $76 billion to make. And he tells them some very bad people are after him and it, and they have to hide it. And if he doesn't come back in a year, put it in a barrel, fill the barrel with concrete and sink it in the ocean. And the father and daughter think, wow, he seemed like a normal sort of homeless man, but I guess he's also completely wacko. Until the next day, all the predicted bad men show up wanting what is in that box and wanting to find who has it. Uh, and it, it was great fun to write. Um. As we as we learn, the 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 box has some qual some qualities that allow the person who possesses it to shift to different uh, different timelines or different um, different universes uh, in, in effect. Um, it, it, this this kind of takes you into an area that explores quantum physics, quantum mechanics, uh, the idea of a multiverse where there are many different timelines and uh, in, in a different timeline right now, you aren't talking to me and I'm not sitting here, we're doing something entirely different. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you came to that, uh, to that topic and uh, you know, what, what, what it was about the idea of different timelines, different universes uh, that appeals to you as a, as a novelist. Flashing into my head was an alternate universe where you and I are aging surfer dudes, and uh, <laughs> that, that would have been fun. That would have uh, been. <laughs> but, but, uh, I never thought I'd write a novel with a 
multiverse as its centerpiece. I read a lot of science. I have a couple hundred books in my library about quantum mechanics and everything related to it, chaos theory and so forth. And a couple thousand books in my library about science because I've always read science for pleasure. But the multiverse thing, I thought, no, I can never use that because it'll be too far out there, too flamboyant, too sci-fi, and it'll turn off the audience that wants something different in their suspense. And this novel started with character uh, because one day it occurred to me, I was doing something else, God knows what, and uh, it wasn't work. And I, I thought, I've never written a story about a father-daughter relationship, and I think I'd like to do that. The next thing I thought was, well, that's not a story, but what if the mother disappeared or walked out on him seven years before his cousin did? That's still not a story. Uh, but what if there was a chance the mother could be found? Well, that's still a very traditional suspense story, and I'm sort of not known for doing things traditionally. And suddenly, into my head popped, but if you went to the multiverse solution, somewhere the mother exists, and maybe somewhere, and anywhere, she exists. And maybe somewhere she never married Jeffy. Maybe somewhere she never gave birth to Amity. And maybe there's somewhere she's alone. And maybe there's somewhere they can find that Michelle and put their family together. Well, that's how the novel started, but it turned into something far more complex than that. And although that remains the sort of underpinning of it. I love books that are about character and relationships. I don't want the premise or the outlandish idea to become dominant of it. And I think in this one, it, it sort of hit my sweet spot for that. Okay. Um, it, it, as far, you mentioned uh, that, that you had not done a father-daughter relationship before. Uh, what was it like to kind of flesh out that, that those two characters, Jeffy and Amity, and kind of build the, both the, the bond and that they have with each other, um, you know, the, the, the sorrow that they feel for the loss of, of the wife and the mother who, who's no longer there for them. Um, to, to tell us a little bit, you know, what, what it was to, what it was like to go, kind of go into those new areas. Well, it's, I, I wanted to make Jeffy somebody who was maybe a little bit like me, something of a dreamer. Uh, only he doesn't write, it, at least not as the novel starts. Uh, but he's a guy who restores Bakelite radios from the Deco period and sells them at, at uh, antique events. Uh, uh, and it so happens I collect Bakelite radios from the 20th and 30th. Uh, and it was a time when even everyday objects were beautiful in the way they were designed instead of just serviceable in the way they were designed as they are now. And I thought that would be a little bit of Jeffy being me. Uh, and he, he loves fantasy novels and he loves uh, that sort of thing. And he's raised Amity to love those novels also. But Amity's a precocious kid, kind of more with it in dealing with things, I think, than her dad is. Although both of them love fantasy novels and it's loving fantasy novels that gives them the knowledge to save their lives when suddenly they're thrust into something pretty fantastic. It was, it was really interesting writing the relationship. Uh, I've never had children, uh, and as a consequence, you have to strain your imagination. But I've written about children a lot, especially precocious children, and, uh, and I love doing that. And uh, so it, it fell into my comfort zone in that way. Um, yeah, Je Jeffy really is a, is a dreamer, and there are, there are many places in, in elsewhere where, you know, Amity basically has to save the day for them and <laughs> take take charge. Um, it, it, in terms of, uh, I want to take just a side trip here for a minute you, in, into something you mentioned a minute ago uh, about all of the, uh, the the reading and science that you do, you know, and in the in the the library of, uh, of science related books that you have what for you as a reader what is it about reading nonfiction and and specifically uh books on science that you find enjoyable i mean you you create imaginary worlds for us to read um but this this world of science and in fact uh it appeals to you tell, tell us a little bit about you know what you what you enjoy about that type of reading 
Well, I think it comes back to, uh, it's something that I probably started getting into in my early 30s. If that you're at that time of life when you're sort of searching for meaning and you've been with the traditional uh, religious aspect and you fade away from it, then you're looking for something else. And science seemed to offer that sort of understanding of the world. Well, in my case, what was interesting about it, the more I read about quantum mechanics, the more I read about molecular biology, which is in the last book devoted, uh, uh, the more I started to see the very world that a lot of faith-based uh, systems of meaning actually teach you. And that is, you're looking at something so complex and so strange that science is the most amazing tool but it cannot give you meaning. What it does show you is the complexity of the natural world. And everything science thought 50 years ago has been stood on its head entirely. And once you read a lot of science, you realize that's the case. What science thinks isn't unchangeable. It changes constantly. And that's because the level of the world we're living in, every time we see a new level to something, especially in molecular biology, and when we see this new level, we think we're now at the base of all things. Look at this, it's so amazingly complex. And you see these thousands of protein chains in every cell in the human body, and all of this other intricate machinery there, and without any of which the cell doesn't work. And then you say, well, we're now at the bottom of it, except we're living in a time where we're beginning to go below that. And we're seeing another level of complexity that exceeds it to the nth degree. And that is fascinating to me. I don't read science looking for ideas uh, because looking for ideas is a dead end. Uh, your subconscious throws them at you when you're least expecting. But sometimes when you feed the subconscious, two years, eight years, 10 years later, it cooks up this idea and throws it at you. And that's why I read science in part, but also because fascinates me that the world endlessly gets more complex. Uh, when I was young and stupid, which in my case is inevitable, and I think most of us were young and stupid, they come together. And I, I sort of thought I knew everything. And one of the great things about growing old is realizing you really don't know anything and neither does anyone else. We're finding our way into the strangeness of, of this world together. And that's what I find so interesting about my life. Okay. It, it, when, when you embarked into the idea of the multiverse and having these different timelines with, with different versions of characters in them, um, how easy or complicated did that end up being, kind of keeping sort of a, a, a system that kept things consistent, I guess, from, from one timeline to the other, um, you know, from one version of, of um, you know, Ed to the other, uh, and, and so on. It would seem like there's the potential for, for getting off into the weeds there a little bit, but what was it like to, to kind of keep track of different, different versions of, uh, uh, of time and, and universe, I guess? Well, I was very acutely aware of that danger uh, because I've read a lot of multiverse stories. Uh, and one of the things that can happen there is the opportunities for imagination run wild. And it's easy, I've seen it, to lose control of it. And the story becomes sometimes extremely difficult to follow. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to keep it about people that we understand and know in a world that we understand and know. So. All of this story takes place in the same little California beach town, Suave Dog Beach, which is really Laguna Beach. I just changed the name, but I kept the geography. And I thought if, I, if they're always moving across the timelines to another version of the same town, and you see all the similarities, but then you encounter what's different about that. The first time they make that little shift, uh, and they go across, it, it pretty much looks like the town they know and everything else. And only gradually uh, do they discover 
some pretty dark things going on in this other version of Swabhadad Beach. And I knew if I kept it in the same town, I kept it with the same characters, that nobody could get confused uh, if I really worked my butt off on it. And that was part of the fun of the story. When you do something you haven't done before, and you recognize the challenges of it, in this case, challenge of not confusing the reader and make it sweet to follow, then that makes it more fun. That makes the work play. Okay. Um, in terms of creating an antagonists uh, for, for this story, you know, you have the, uh, the kind of men in black who are, who are out there trying to hunt down this device and, and take it away from the, uh, uh, from, from Jeffy and Amity and, the, and their leader, uh, Fallbrook, uh, uh, you know, is particularly ruthless. Um, but behind him, we were given, you know, the hints of, of powerful people who are pulling the strings that we, we can't quite tell. But I, I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, picking, picking the bad guys or creating the bad guys in a story, whether it's elsewhere or, or any of your books, you know, it, it, how enjoyable it is to try to think about, you know, what kind of person you're going to to create who is this, you know, hand of, of, of evil doing off screen, perhaps, or even on, on the page. Um, it, and, and kind of what it's like to, to write, you know, the bad guys compared to our heroes, which in this case are, are Jeffy and, and Amity and, and Ed, uh, once they connect up with him. Well, uh, I, I tend to not write bad guys that are, uh, uh, they're out to steal your lunch money or rob a bank or uh, I tend to go with flat out sociopaths uh, because I think there are more of them in society than we quite recognize. Uh, and in the case of Falkirk on this, Falkirk is an interesting sociopath. He's, uh, he's in, a, in a solid uh, government operation that he seems to answer to almost nobody uh, in his little bureaucratic place. But he's also something of a coward. Uh, he's not a guy until the end of the story that would actually completely indulge in his violent fantasies against our leads, but he would happily appoint other people to do it. Um, and uh, when those other people keep failing him toward the end of the book, Falkirk gets in touch with the devil within uh, in a major way. It's, it's exciting to me to like bad guys, and I always have to be careful that you don't get charmed by them too much, because that is a tendency, Bonnie and Clyde's scene, uh, where you, you sort of get attracted to the bad characters because of their glamorous nature or their supposed glamorous nature. I never want the reader to identify positively with the bad people. So I tend to also always make them foolish, because in my view of the world, that is true. Evil, it works in the short term. It never works in the long term. It's, it's doom uh, within your lifetime by the choice of evil. Unless you're somebody like Stalin uh, and they can last for a long time. But generally speaking, no, it's a stupid and evil decision, or evil is a stupid decision. So by making them unconsciously funny, uh, like they don't realize they're fools. You know, they may realize some of the people that work with them, all realizes that his minions are kind of incompetent uh, and he mocks them, but at the same time, he's equally incompetent and it will undo him in the end. Uh, as long as I play with that, I have great fun with writing evil, as long as I don't have to make them somebody that you would sort of think, wow, I would like to be there. That, that would mean I failed writing a good sociopath because that's not who. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you don't want people to to root for the sociopath over the 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 loving <laughs> father and daughter. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, as far as uh, the the kind of shared passion that Jeffy and Amity have for for fantasy uh, novels, there one of the things that I found fun in reading the book was. Um, the, the references to other uh, 
other books, and it's it's clear that you're you know you're you're familiar and a, and a reader of of many of those kinds of books. But in, in particular, uh, the the Princess Bride shows up at a couple of a uh, couple of points in the story. Um, what do you enjoy about that book uh, so much? What what makes that a, a you know a, a one of your one of your references here, but also just a personal personal favorite? Well, first of all, I, I so identify with, uh, as a writer with the work of William Goldman. He was a acclaimed screenwriter, but the truth was he was a better novelist even than he was a screenwriter, but he never quite broke through as a novelist to the same degree. At first he did it with books like Boys and Girls Together and Certain Things, but over his life he created some incredible novels. Uh, the Color of Water and some others that are not even in print. Uh, and I always admired his ability to just go for it. He would take the most outlandish idea and he would make it work. And Princess Bride is one of those, as Amity and Jeffy both realized. Princess Bride is the absolute antithesis of what the normal fantasy novel is. Things do not go well for the heroes. They don't go well for anybody. Everything ends up in the soup for everybody at the end of it. And it's, it's hilarious at the same time, it's, uh, it's gripping and fantastical. And that was an incredible feat to pull off. Um, I admire people who go outside the box and especially if they go outside the box, the box comes in. And he certainly always did. So it was fun to reference that. And, Another writer, she writes for young adults, but writes for adults actually is Kate DiCamillo. And I, I reference her books, The Tale of Despero, uh, The Magician's Elephant. Uh, these books published for young adults or even for middle grade, um, but are fabulous books for adults. Uh, and she's one of those people who was able to break out of her uh, her slot, her label, and become something bigger and more interesting. And, and I knew that Jeffy and Amnesty love her too. So it, it's sort of, they're, they're sort of, they love the kind of fantasy I like. And, uh, that's where you get to let the author intrude without ruining the story. Are, are you a re-reader? Will you, will you go back to a favorite book and, and read it over every few years? Oh my, yeah. Uh, I have read everything by John D. McDonald probably three and four times each. Uh, learned more from him than Charles Dickens than any other writers. Uh, and, and you learn from all writers. But in those particular cases, I reread and reread. And last year I read, uh, I can't remember, Six Time or whatever, uh, Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, which always leads me to end the book in tears. Uh, it has the most wonderful ending of any novel I think I've ever read because of this how hopeless alcoholic lawyer who ends up sacrificing his own life for the woman who he loves but will never love him and he sacrifices his life at passing to the man who loves her. So it's the most incredible uh, ending to a novel and very touching. Uh, so yeah, those sort of things I really, really came to think no, well, I've really read the Princess Bride. Uh, the older you get, strangely, the more you go back to reread stuff. Uh, sometimes thinking, I hope I don't go back and find this thing to be awful that I've loved all my life. And it's so exciting when you go back and read it, it's just as good as you remember. Once in a while, it isn't, but that just means. Um, it, it, as far as the. It, you, you talked earlier, we talked earlier about science and how, you know, as science advances and as we learn more about things, um, we come to unexpected, we find unexpected uh, new knowledge. And, and I guess I'm curious, you know, in your reading about the, the idea of a multiverse and, and multiple timelines, you know, it's still a kind of a thing that we can't really say for sure has happened uh, or exists, but there is kind of, you know, theories and, and, and writing by, you know, highly respected and, and very intelligent people that, that 
make the case for it or the pot for the possibility of it at least. Um, how do you sort of view the the likelihood that that there might be you know that this theory that these theories might have some have some truth to them and that we just don't know it yet? Well, the, the multiverse was first uh, proposed in uh, 1957, so it's a pretty old theory. And it's, uh, it comes out of the work of Heidegger and a number of other scientists and comes out of quantum mechanics. And a number of experiments that seem to show us uh, that there is, in fact, multiple realities beyond our own or timelines. Uh, it's, it's a theory we'll probably never be able to prove, uh, though there is some evidence of it. There is uh, quantum mechanics, if it didn't work, we wouldn't have television, for instance. There's so many things that we're used to living with that quantum mechanics proves, uh, proved the path way forward with the science. Uh, and uh, so uh, I was particularly, as the book evolved, uh, I began to realize something that was gonna happen at the end of it. And that's because a friend of mine said, well, if there's a multiverse, that, that proves there isn't a God. It's just you know infinite number of universes and they keep splitting off one from the other and we live many lives and maybe in others and so forth. So forth. And as I began to consider that, which I hadn't before, but as I began to write the story, I got to where Amity does at the end. And she says, what a crazy ass way to design a design reality with thousands or millions of universes in an infinite array and each of us live in hundreds maybe thousands of universes in which we make different decisions but in the end our life is like one great tree and all those universes are different branches and the value of our lives are how our tree looks is it withered and decayed throughout is it flourishing? Does it have good areas and bad? This is our life. And she says, actually, that universe would be a universe of infinite mercy, which actually says, maybe God, because it would keep giving you other chances to do the right thing. Uh, and I've never seen anybody propose that. I've now had mail from some quantum mechanics people who say, what an idea. They found it kind of fascinating. But that came out of the character of Amy. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it led me somewhere I thought was kind of interesting and fun to propose. Um, if, you, if you opened your door to pick up your newspaper in the morning and you found the key to everything, which is the name for the device that, that Jeffy and Amity find, uh, that, that, that they're given, um, and, and you had the opportunity to to travel to other multiverses, uh, would you would you do it? And and what would you hope to hope to learn by doing that? I would absolutely not do it. <laughs> I, I I have a pretty good universe here. My life has worked out pretty all right. I don't need to go to see how he screwed up because I'm sure that's happened in many other multiverses, uh, and I wouldn't want to meet those versions of myself. Aside from that, Peter, as you know, I don't even fly. So the idea of pressing a button on this device and going God knows where would not appeal to me at all. And in the novel, one of the things I knew was a, a hang up to this idea is if some spooky guy, spooky Ed, they call him, gives you this ratty old gift box tied up with string and gives you this spiel about a $76 billion device, and that if he doesn't come back, it would put it in a barrel and fill it with concrete and sink it in the ocean. And yet you get it and open the box. What kind of idiot pushes that button when he finally realizes maybe this is real because all these agents are trying to find it. That, that's sort of like, don't go into that house. <laughs> they all go in anyway. Right. And then they're told to get out and nobody will leave. Uh, so I wanted to, how, why would they push that button on that device? And Amity has a little white mouse uh, as a pet. She's trying to work her way up to the dog, but she doesn't know if she has a responsibility. 
cure for that yet. So she figures, okay, the mouse lives for three or four years. If we screw up with the mouse, it's not as big a deal. Uh, and the mouse is on her shoulder. It sees this glimmering device. It's not giving away much. This happens in chapter two or three. It was running down around and jumps on the device. And that's what triggers it. Uh, and uh, so unless I would have a mouse or let my dog anywhere near that device, I would never press, it, press the button. I, I can imagine uh, enough danger in my life to not want to seek out more of it in alternate universe. Right. <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, that would be maybe thrilling and also terrifying. <laughs> you want to be careful with that. <laughs> um, I think uh, we're getting a lot of uh, questions from the chat, so I think maybe we'll segue to to posing some of those to you. And uh, they they range from questions about elsewhere, but also all across your uh, your um, uh, history, your career as a writer. So I'll, I'm just going to kind of put a few of these out there and 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 let you have a chance to answer them. Uh, th this one comes from Barbara Howe, who asks, you know, when did you know you wanted to be a writer and why this kind of writing as opposed to uh, any, other, uh, any other genre? You know, what it was that drew you in this direction as a, as a writer? Well, I, I have said before that I started writing stories on tablet paper when I was eight years old. The only title I remember was The Magical Puppet. And it, I would draw pictures or a cover, write it out, I'd staple the one side, pedal this little book with a relative sprinkle. I was the writer, agent, publisher, uh, the whole schmear. I was bookseller. Uh, and I, I think because books started to be an escape from an unpleasant environment for me. But when I started writing, I started writing science fiction because that's what I read as a kid. And then, I realized that isn't where my heart was. I was never going to be first rated at that. So then I segued into other things. And I wrote a comic novel uh, that was highly well reviewed, but didn't sell. And that was, they told me, well, comic novels almost never sell. So I thought, OK, I, there's no point in shooting myself in the head. Uh, history will do that to us all anyway. So. Uh, Let's just, uh, let's just change and do something else. And then I moved into suspense. Uh, but as years passed by, I found myself mushing up genres. I, I was started introducing a little element of fantastic, or I'd combine a suspense novel with a heartfelt love story. Uh, and you can't imagine the blowback I got from publishers in those days. There weren't such kind of novels then. You, you were given a label and you're supposed to stick to it. I've had a few people say I invented cross genre novel. It was not my intention to invent it. Uh, all I did was, as a reader, I've always read everything. Literary fiction to me is just another genre. I read the same amount of that as suspense. I read Westerns. I read everything. And as a writer, I just wanted to touch all those bases. Not 12 of them in one novel, but two, maybe three in a novel. Uh, and that's what has led me in this direction. It wasn't until I was in college and I sold my first short story as a senior in college that I realized, huh, this might be a career. It took a long time after that before it really was a viable career. But uh, that's sort of how it all started. OK, all right. Um, uh, Bruce Lichty, I'm not sure I'm saying his name right. Um, is, is re, says he's reading elsewhere right now and and has the sense that there are some references in there to pacifism um, and that he hasn't seen maybe in other books um, and he was just curious about that if you know if that is if that is something that uh, it has been you know in your creative mind of late um, and and it's kind of uh, coming through maybe in this book where maybe in the past you you didn't include things you know in, in your stories that that reflected that interest? Well, I'm not a pacifist. Uh, I, I do believe there is real evil in the world that needs to be at all times resisted when we see it. That being said, uh, I think our history of, in my lifetime has been uh, replete with nonsense wars that uh, if, if you're going to fight a war, then it better be important 
and you better fight it to win and win it quickly. And when you see how quickly, it never seemed so at the time. But World War II didn't take 15 years. It didn't take 10 years. It was over within a few years, five years, I guess, probably, you could say. Uh, and uh, that, if war has to be fought, and the enemy is something truly dark and evil, then fight it and finish it. But we've had in my lifetime so many wars that are not really wars, they're sort of, well, that polite word, police actions, gets raised. And it's not right to ask your fellow citizens to sacrifice their lives in something that the generals have no intention and the politicians of actually winning. Uh, and uh, I, I think Jeffy probably feels sort of that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you get a little bit of that through Jeffy. But I wouldn't say he's a pacifist. He has to club somebody real hard he does it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Karen wants to know if there's any more plans for uh, additional Odd Thomas books. That's a favorite series uh, for a lot of readers, I think. Um, so is there, is there any chance we'll see more or has Odd, Odd Thomas, uh, you know, gone to bed for, for good for you? <laughs> well, you know, I just fell in love with that character and uh, I could have written about him forever, I think. Uh, but there was one obligation I had to him. Characters become really real to me when I'm writing and uh, and odd, I had such love for him and for his worldview. And uh, in, in the first book, when he's given a promise by a carnival fortune telling machine uh, about his girlfriend, and I don't want to be giving spoilers away, but it says you are destined to be together forever. I, he took that as serious, and I took it as serious. And then when he and she will not be together by the end of that novel. Uh, I felt that was an obligation to Odd that I had to fulfill. And I couldn't make it dirty books or anything like that. Also, I knew that Odd was on a journey toward absolute humility. And that was the center of the character. He was going to be somebody who is a strangely humble to begin with for an action hero in that kind of story. But Book by book, I knew he was going to get to total humility. I had no idea how to write that because, believe it or not, Peter, I'm not totally humble. <laughs> so how did you write about that? Uh, but he got there in the strangest way. And he got that carnival fortune telling machine. Uh, that promise was fulfilled. I did play with the idea of writing his girlfriend, Stormy had said in the first novel that the life we're living is one of three. This was her personal philosophy. We're in boot camp and we're here to learn how to, to take care of ourselves and how to deal with loss and then all the rest of it. The next life is a life of service in some big horrendous cause. And the third life, according to Stormy, is the eternal life. Well, I did think about writing a novel that said, Stormy's right, when on, passes from this world and sees her again, uh, they're involved in some enormous, uh, terrifying uh, war in which they're on the side of righteousness. And I thought of writing this giant fantasy novel uh, about that. And I someday still play around with it. But then I thought, I don't know. I don't want to take away from what those first eight novels accomplished, at least in 99. So I doubt there'll be another odd novel, but I do have a novel partly done with the characters really excited me like Odd has. And it's something very different and strange. And I'm, I, I think he could end up being more than one novel. Oh, okay. Um, let's see, we have one from, uh, from Michael Maybe, who is a big fan of your Frankenstein series. Um, and says that he particularly loves Jocko and thinks he's one of the most endearing and entertaining of your characters. Um, and, and wanted to know, uh, where did the inspiration for, for, for Jocko come from? Jocko is one of my favorite characters ever. He's, he, he's not in the first novel. And then when he starts making his appearance, he's actually sort of a monster. Well, he is totally a monster, <laughs> but he's a monster with heart. And, uh, 
and he's got such such an optimistic view of life at the same time that he thinks he's doomed. And his 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 mix of character traits just once Jocko walked into the story, I had, I couldn't stop putting him in until I thought if I keep the series going, it's going to become all about Jocko. And uh, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad he enjoyed him as much as I did because. Uh, I have to tell you that when I would write scenes with Chaka, I'd be howling sometimes with laughter because I would never know what he was about to say or do next. Uh, and uh, he is at the same time such as a sweet character, uh, one that everybody, animals and everybody he encounters, despise him and want to kill him and beat him in the first couple of books he appears in. But as you gradually learn about Chaka and what a sweet character he is, yeah, I hope that. Someday he would find his place in the world, and he did. So uh, I thought that series might be longer, but of course that sprang out of writing a TV uh, script, having it picked up by a network, asked me to expand it. Marty Scorsese came in wanting to direct it. They'd already brought in a young director. Hadn't made a deal yet, but Marty said, I won't take work away from a young director, but I'd like to produce this. And I thought, we have an 800 pound gorilla on the project now. This will go great, except it didn't. They, they went away and got another writer. They let away everything of value in it. Marty wrote me a beautiful letter after saying, I would have directed your script without changing anything. I can't believe this happened. Uh, and that's why I went and wrote the models. I wanted to say, here's what the TV could have been. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and never had a chance to. Um, I, I'm going to pair up a couple here. This uh, D.D. Jacobs asks, which of your characters is most like you? And uh, Barbara Howe, who, who I mentioned earlier, had asked, which fictional character would you like to have dinner with? So do you have a character you feel is most like you? And do you have a, a literary figure, you know, a figure from any book that you've ever encountered that, you know, that you would, uh, uh, you know, want to have a, have a dinner with? Well, there's a little bit of me in different characters. There's a little bit of me in Jocko, <laughs> a little monster. There's uh, there, that part of Odd that's sort of wide-eyed wonder at the world is definitely me. Uh, uh, and different characters have different parts of you in them. Uh, so there isn't any one of them that is entirely me at all. Uh, characters that I read about would be interesting have uh, have dinner with. Uh, I think there's probably so many that uh, it would have to be a large dinner party. Uh, I can't immediately think of one in particular, uh, but probably as soon as this is over, I'll think, damn, I should have said this. But right now, <laughs> I'm at a loss. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's fair. Um... Uh, Jacob Bach mentions that in many of your earlier books, the love story carried with it another dimension of redemption or becoming whole. Um, and he, he want, that's, that's his sense of it. Um, it you know, and he, he kind of wants to know, you know, was that your intent to kind of use the storytelling to, to help the people kind of find something that was missing, I guess, in their lives? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's very smart reading of it. Uh, it, it's endemic to almost everything I write, that uh, none of us is whole. Uh, we're a species that needs uh, human contact, that needs one another. And uh, it's in our relationships with other people that we complete ourselves, if we're fortunate, if we don't live a life without having that happen. It doesn't have to be husband and wife eventually. It, does, it can be brother and brother. It can be any sort of relationship completes us, uh, and if we have more than one or two or three of those relationships, that's a very rich life. Uh, so yeah, that was always my characters. Sometimes I, I have somebody say, your characters are also perfect. That's a misreading of what I write. They all have something missing in them, and they all have flaws. Uh, they, they are, they're not necessarily all of them going out to hack people up. Uh, but they do have flaws there. They are as an emptiness of some kind or other in them. And they're seeking that, that, that relationship or those relationships that will complete them. And that also, of course, is a perfect example of that. 
finding the mother that they lost. Uh, but it's even finding more than a mother. By the end of the story, and this is true of quite a number of my novels, a family has been um, of a significant number of people. Uh, and it's, it's not a family by blood necessarily all of it, but it is a family by uh, like-mindedness. Um, it, it, uh, Jackie, Jackie Sherman uh, sent in a question, um, which I think is kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's also her birthday, so we should, we should definitely ask her question. She's watching on her birthday. Uh, she asks, if you've ever encountered a character in your writing that argued with you over how the story would be played out. That happens all the time since I stopped using outlines, which I stopped and then I had my first bestseller stranger. Uh, I, I start with the premise, I don't have an outline, I don't know where it's going. And that's why it tends to start with the premise, but sometimes with the characters like Elsewhere did. And if it starts with the premise, then the characters come immediately thereafter because the premise suggests certain themes that are going to be subtextual in that story or even on the surface. And who are the characters best able to carry that or support those themes that are going to be part of that story? Uh, and therefore, the characters become as important as the premise or more important. Uh, and uh, then the characters take you places you don't always see them going. I remember in Life Expectancy, which opens with the character in a hospital going from one end of the hospital where his wife is about to give birth to their child, their first child, to the other end of the hospital where his father is dying of a stroke. And he's back and forth and back and forth and it's about the promise uh, and of uh, uh, life and the terribleness of death. And uh, in that sequence, he's in the father's, expectant father's lounge with one other father. And I didn't know what this character was going to be, except I knew he was going to be the antagonist. He was going to be the threat throughout this. And I was writing, uh, and I said, I, I described the room first, and then I said, but more disturbing than the room, or something like this, more disturbing than the room was the chain-smoking clown. And I literally wrote the word clown on a sub subconsciously, and I stopped dead, because the character was telling me he's a clown. I said, well, that can't work. You can't be a clown. It's just too absurd. And then I thought, well, if there was a circus in town, I mean, why is that character telling me clown, clown, clown? And I thought, well, he doesn't have to have big shoes and a red wig. He can be like an Emmett Pilly clown, a sad sack clown with a little bit of paint, dressed in a raggedy suit, but very strange and dangerous. And that's what he became. As that book evolved, I looked back on it and thought, this novel wouldn't have worked if he hadn't been a clown. And there I spent an hour or two kind of arguing with him about this. And yet the whole thing becomes this circus as background. And, uh, and all of it simply wouldn't work without that. So when the characters argue with you sometimes, it's best to listen. OK. Um, th that, that answer. Uh, it, it, directs me to a, to a question that's kind of related. This, uh, and this, this has got to be the farthest away question we got tonight. This is from uh, Magnus uh, in Norway, where it's 2 a.m. Uh, he, he wanted to tune in. Um, and he, he notes that uh, in, in the Norwegian translation, the title of Life Expectancy is don't trust the clown. So they kind of, <laughs> <laughs> they kind of <laughs> made the clown the center of the title as well. Um, he, he, his question is, you know, to, for, from an aspiring writer, how do you find the discipline to write for hours on end without being distracted by everything else that's going on in, in the world, you know, uh, around us? Uh, that's the hardest thing. Uh, it's, you have to develop, a, I, I get up in the morning at, 5.30, I, I shower, walk the dog, have breakfast, read the morning paper. Then I'm starting to work at 7, 7.30 at the latest. I work straight through the day. And it used to be easier. Email has, has been the worst thing for 
writers. It used to be when somebody in your publishing life had a question, they'd call you. And you'd talk it out in five minutes and it'd be done. And I found out email, you'll get five emails about an issue that you would have discussed on the phone and in no time. And then you have to answer them at five different times during the day. Uh, that's been the biggest distraction for me. But in recognition of that, I never go online. I have an assistant who goes online. I come down here and say what I want her to find. She'll find it for me. But I know my obsessive nature, so I stay away from the things that I would become obsessed about, which would be going online. But once I started surfing and looking into things, I could spend all day doing it. And uh, so it's focusing. It's I love writing. I don't like having written. I know writers who like having written, but don't like writing. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, they love the publicity part. They love the touring part. I've never toured. Uh, I try to stay away from that as much. I sort of like what we're doing now because it has more substance, it seems to me, than, uh, than kind of here's your publicist gives you 10 questions somebody wants you to answer. Uh, you know, you write them out and that sort of thing. Or uh, network TV stuff I've never found particularly interesting uh, because mostly nobody who interviews you has ever read. <laughs> but newspaper interviews, radio interviews have. So I've limited myself to the kind of publicity out there where it seems more meaningful to me. And then if you love writing and you can block out the time, it's, and, and you love the language, then it becomes as much, it's hard work. It's never less than that, but it becomes play. Uh, and it becomes a challenge, especially if you don't write the same book time every time. And you're always taking yourself to the edge to see if you can get away with something or pull it off. That to me is the technique that has kept me involved in it the longest. Um, we, we've got a couple of questions that are that are sort of thematically the same, and, and they fit with a question that I, I think I asked you when we originally talked, uh, which is, I asked you if you know you thought about maybe writing another book with uh, with Jeffy and Amity. Um, we have a question from Al Guevara, uh, who, who says he remembers in two thousand and eight that there was going to be that you had said there would be a third Christopher Snow novel. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there's also a reader who wants to know if, if there might be follow-up books for Nameless and Devoted. So I guess I'd ask you about, I, I, I guess I'd, I'd ask you about those in specific, but just in, in general, you know, also your feelings about going back and, and doing a sequel or a series as you did with Odd Thomas or with the Frankenstein books. Um, so yeah, I guess the specifics of uh, Nameless, Devoted, and and Christopher Snow, and and then just in general uh, sequels. Well, let me get Christopher Snow dealt with. I've done this a number of times, but not everybody hears the same thing. I was prepared to write the third Christopher Snow. I had changed publishers, and the first book I wrote for the new publisher was to do nothing, and he seemed to like it, and everything was okay. But I delivered Seize the Night next, and there was consternation. Uh, it was, quote unquote, too funny. Uh, he didn't want to talk to me about what he wanted done. He wanted to talk to my agent about it. And I, I had to make some changes, but I didn't make 10% of the changes that were we wanted. And I realized if I do the third Christopher Snow, I'm probably going to be looking for a new publisher already. And I didn't want to have to change publishers. So I said, all right, I'll do some other things and I'll come back to this. The other things just kept evolving. False memory from the corner of his eye went away from me. Uh, and I wrote part of the third Christopher Snow. But because the enthusiasm wasn't there, uh, it's kind of writing into a wall if you know there is this great enthusiasm. Now, I know the public has a great enthusiasm. Christopher Snow and that world. And so I got a lot of mail, and so do I. But sometimes who you deal with in the publishing world takes the path you have to take. Uh, then I got to the point where I changed publishers. Uh, and now somewhere 
where there isn't a resistance to what I want to do. And I thought the other day, maybe it's time to go back to the Christopher Snell that the first two books are stuck at an old publisher. But I did suddenly think, you know, you could almost approach it as if I'd never written by Christopher Snell before and not repeat stuff in that, but give you all the background with a new exciting story. I'm still working with that in my head. Uh, let's see, other, uh, now I thought so much on that, I forgot what the other part of that question. It was just kind of going back and writing uh, additional books after you've written one. I know when, when I asked you about Elsewhere, you said that you, you probably weren't going to, um, but you know that you had so many other ideas that are kind of bubbling around or that you're already at work on. Um, so yeah, it was just in general, you know, doing sequels or series. Yeah, I, I, I once said I would never write a series. So then I did Thomas and Frankenstein books and uh, started the Christmas Christ stuff. And uh, uh, there's characters I would like to go back and revisit, but it really does come down to that. that the ideas keep coming and they're a different, Kind and they excite me more than repetitive stuff. Jeffy and Amity, I think their story's been told, so I won't go there. I did mention I've got this idea for a character. What's well, more than that? I've got part of the model. And it's really cool. He's, he's different, uh, he's very appealing, uh, and he's in desperate trouble from the opening of the first novel. And it has, it relates to something that everybody, a lot of people are doing right now that I think is dangerous. And so I'm going to have fun with that aspect of it. I can see this character as somebody who might go into three books uh, or something like that. But in the end, it's the characters to tell you whether there's a future. And I don't want to force it. Uh, for years, I was asked to write a sequel to Watchers. And I said, only if I can make it better than the first book. And when the idea for Devoted came to me, it's not a sequel to Watchers, but it takes that idea of enhanced intelligence in the other species, and in dogs in particular, with a different explanation entirely. It's not something that happened in the lab, it's something that's pulled out of the human dog bone. And it's sort of a semi-sequel, or seems to be thematically, but it isn't. It's only the characters an explanation. It was interesting to do that, revisiting the premise and taking a totally new approach on it. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I'm at a certain age, Peter, so if I say I'm going to write a series, I better think, okay, what age am I going to be by the time I, I would hope to finish that series. Okay. Well, we, we, all, we all, I'm sure, hope that you've got many more years of writing. Uh, we want to we want to thank you for your your time tonight. It's been it's been great having a chance to to do this with you and and kind of share our conversation uh, with with readers and fans all you know from from here to Norway. Uh, <laughs> um, so thank you thank you again, Dean, for for you know sharing yourself with us. It's been great. Um, just a, a program note for for those who are fans of the registers Zoom author talks. Um, we will be restarting the Lit Up Holiday Cheer series on November 6th. Um, I, I think uh, November, November 6th, 20th, December 4th, and December 18th. So keep an eye out for that. We'll have, uh, we'll have some interesting authors lined up uh, to kind of talk us through the holiday seasons, season. Um, yeah, so thank you all for, for, for being here tonight. And, you know, and especially again, you know, thank you for, for you being here, Dean. It was great to, uh, to have you. Thanks for having me there. And when the holidays come, I always tend to get lit up. So. Okay, good. As, as we all should, right? To get the holiday cheer. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you, everyone, and, uh, and, and everyone enjoy the rest of your evening. It's been great to, uh, to share this with you.